the macro international family is very much about people first, lawyers second. That's what we build the business on. Now, some of the questions that when I asked you to register or when MIHQ asked you to register that were coming through were very much about how do I learn? How do I make more money as, a, as an up and coming lawyer? How do I engage with other people? And we are very fortunate to have Rich Bracken from Minnesota, keynote speaker, ex-DJ, climber, fiery brain, to talk with us about something, a skill that is very often either overlooked or doesn't get written into the top three skills that you need as a business person and as a lawyer. And I'm gonna hand the reins over to Rich in a second, because the next half an hour or so is going to be, he's gonna be leading the show. That's why he's got his fancy birthday suit on. Um, and this is your opportunity to learn from somebody outside who's been on both sides of the wall, whose experience is almost unparalleled, who has been on TV. And as I've got to know him purely over Zoom over the past few weeks, is a great guy uh, and an extraordinarily uh, competent and engaging speaker. So again, I'm gonna ask you just to mute and then I'm gonna hand over to you, Rich, for the next bit. And then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna get you engaging across different parts of the world. So Rich, for now, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very, very much for that introduction. And I will absolutely ensure that the check makes it to you uh, for that introduction. So I greatly appreciate that. Um, the one thing that I, I find ironic um, is that when you talk about emotional intelligence, so this is a key skill as far as patience and being able to pivot in the world. And <laughs> seeing as how I, my sharing is disabled, um, Keith, is, Keith is testing me at this moment to make sure that I, I pivot on my own emotional intelligence. So if, if somebody, there we go. See, he knew I was gonna figure that out. Um, but first of all, I wanna thank you all for being here and for having this conversation with me, because it will be a conversation as much as I love to talk and as much as Keith knows I love to talk. I want this to be a conversation because what I have found over the last several years in working with uh, law firms, legal associations, as well as in-house counsel at Fortune 50 companies and, and Fortune 100 companies, um, I have found that emotional intelligence has been a game changer for legal professionals. And I always set up a little bit of a statistic that gives you hope and gives you white space for improvement. And that statistic that I want to give you is that lawyers by nature are the second worst emotional intelligence profession in the world. Only scarily to doctors who are the worst in the world. So those that we put our lives in <laughs> both physically and, and financially and in and, and a lot of different ways, those two professions have the lowest emotional intelligence. But the benefit is, is that as strong as your IQ may be, your EQ, your emotional intelligence can be improved. So it's like a, your mental muscle, your emotional muscle, by training it, by working it out, by, by spending time with it, you can improve. And it's not a fault of yours that it is that way. You've been trained and educated to be perfect. You've been trained and educated to be flawless. And emotional intelligence is that ability to bounce back from mistakes. So you don't think about wanting to make mistakes. Nobody does. But when we have mistakes or we have curveballs or we have situations that are stressful, emotional intelligence is the one thing that gets us through any of those situations. So today I want to talk a little bit about emotional intelligence and I'll get my, my presentation pulled up here. Um, this is the obligatory Zoom conversation that everybody has. So let me pull my screen up and then let me know if you can see my screen. Everybody can see that. Give me if you want to give me a thumbs up or a, a clap. Uh, that'll be my, my silent approval that I will need from you all. 
Um, so really what, we, what, I, what I want to do today is talk about how you can balance your life both personally and professionally through emotional intelligence. And some of the things that we're going to talk about today is what is emotional intelligence? It may be a term that you've heard before. You've, this may be the first time you've ever had a discussion about emotional intelligence. And so we'll discuss what it actually is and what, compro what comprises your emotional intelligence as an individual. We'll talk about different triggers and scenarios that can cue your emotional intelligence both positively and negatively. And what I want to implore upon you right now is that you're not going to walk out of this presentation oblivious to stress, oblivious to anger, and completely impenetrable to bad moods and, and, and negative thoughts. But what I'm going to do is give you the identification of these triggers and scenarios and give you the tools to work through them so that you spend less time in that stress, you spend less time in that anger, and you take control back of your emotions, again, in your personal and your professional settings. I'm gonna give you the techniques to improve your emotional intelligence. As I mentioned, there are several things and most of them, if not all of them are fun to do. So I'm gonna give you these tools and tricks to be able to increase your emotional intelligence because again, no matter where you are on the spectrum of emotional intelligence, you can always get better. Me, I talk about it all the time. I've studied it for years and it is something that I work on all the time because I want to keep getting better. And then finally, the personal and professional benefits. You know, when we talk about any kind of a, an effort, especially in the legal world, you know, I've coached hundreds of attorneys on how to be better business developers, be better client service individuals, be better pres presenters and, and communicators. But I always have to lead with, what do I get out of it? This is, what it? this is what I'm going to give you at the end of this presentation is what those benefits are so that you know that the effort you put into it is going to result in some really good outcomes that are going to help you on a daily basis. So outside of a, a very adorable, uh, expressive young lady here, what I want to talk about is what is emotional intelligence. And so I've given you both the long version and the short version. And really, the way I describe it is that it's a dance. It's a dance not only with yourself, but with everybody around you. And that's relationships that you're in, colleagues, clients, individuals that you come across, complete strangers, everybody affects your emotional intelligence throughout the day. So it is understanding all of the different components of emotional intelligence, the triggers that happen throughout the entire day, and how you can be the lead in that dance, as opposed to being pulled around in a whirlwind of, of confusion and frustration. Uh, so really, all it is is navigating your emotions and those of others to live a better personal and professional life. Now, when we talk about emotional intelligence, there are several schools of thought. This is the one that I subscribe to that I found the most benefit. Um, it is also the most concise and condensed version. So it's more empowering to me to understand the four elements versus some that are 12, 13 different elements that are, that are a little bit harder to navigate. So this is based off of Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by Dr. Travis Bradbury, which is what got me into emotional intelligence to begin with. One of the best books I've ever read. It's a phenomenal read, very empowering, very uh, gives you a lot of tools on how to, how to enhance and understand emotional intelligence. But Dr. Bradbury breaks it down into four different elements. Self-awareness, which is understanding what your emotions are and how you, how you navigate them, how you feel them, what they are. Because sometimes we don't understand our true emotions. You may get upset about something and it may be, you know, if Keith tells me something that offends me, it may not be what Keith is saying and how Keith is saying it but it may be an emotion from the past. So understanding that that emotion is not necessarily exactly what's happening in that moment. So really digging into your emotions, understanding all of your emotions, good, bad, and indifferent. Because again, when we don't acknowledge the fact that we stress out, that we get angry, that we get upset, that we get sad, that we get depressed sometimes, those, if we just shift those, uh, those feelings aside and those emotions aside, we rob ourselves of control. We rob ourselves of power in our lives because we're not admitting those things. So then we move on to self-management. And self-management is really, once you understand your emotions, what you're doing with them. So I, I'm sure, and, and if you want to give me a thumbs up or an applause here, if you know somebody that just tends to either fly off the handle in a positive or a negative way, somebody that is considered a hothead, somebody that cannot contain or control their emotions. Those are people that are obviously feeling their emotions, but don't know quite how to handle them and how to, how to use them effectively. And those communication points can be, very, they, they can be very traumatic in a relationship. They can break trust. They can do all kinds of bad things. So understanding your emotions is key, but then what you do with them is really, really important. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit when we talk about scenarios. 
Now, that is the individual dance, how you're managing yourself and how you're navigating your own self. And then when you move into working with other people and, and how their emotions affect you, social awareness is really being able to understand the emotions of others, reading body language, listening to tone, really picking up on active listening cues. That is a key factor in personal relationships. It's imperative in client relationships. It's really critical in colleague relationships. Because if you're not actively listening, if you're not watching for those cues, you could miss out on some key communication uh, decisions in those conversations. So really focusing in on active listening and paying attention to the individual that you're working with and just what you're picking up on from an energy standpoint is key. And in a virtual environments, it's tough to do that because sometimes we're on mute. Sometimes we're not, you know, we're looking at somebody on a screen that maybe is, you know, they're multitasking, so they're not truly paying attention. So that virtual environment has escalated the need for active listening. So that is really, really important that you hone in on, on, on finding, fine tuning that ability. And then all of those things wrapped into one is relationship management, how you're managing yourself, but then how you're managing other people. So if you think about really good leaders, like think about a person that you have followed either within the industry or out of the industry, somebody that you've admired because of the way they handle people or the way they communicate with people, or that person that everybody just seems to get along with, they have a very strong emotional intelligence throughout because they can navigate themselves, but they can also navigate others. So why is this so important to legal professionals? As I mentioned earlier, the industry average is second worst in emotional intelligence. That's just, uh, that's a statistical fact. So I wanna talk about some of the key factors why it's important for legal professionals to fine tune and, and master their emotional intelligence. Number one, you are logical people, but you also have emotions. And so when you think about logic, you use logic when you're figuring out a matter or a, 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 a negotiation on, a, on an M&A transaction, if you're navigating a case, you're working your logic because that's what you're trained to do. That's what you are really, really good at. But logic can override emotion sometimes. Sometimes you may have a feeling about uh, a case or a, a conversation that you're having with a client or a conversation across the table that you're not leveraging your emotion in that conversation because you're too focused on the logical side of things. So bringing in emotion helps you develop relationships better. It helps you understand the other side better. It helps you understand your clients better. So understanding that balance of logic and emotion is really, really important where you're not letting one override the other. Creativity and strength. When you're focusing on, cre on creativity and strength, you're better problem solvers. You're more resilient in situations. You become a better communicator and you become a better problem solver by leveraging your emotional intelligence. Sometimes when a law says something, we don't think the, a creative solution or we don't think outside of what is written and we just go with what's logical and what's in the black and white written word and those attorneys that i've worked with or those professional services individuals that i've worked with that have been very highly regarded by their clients are ones that can think creatively come up with problem solutions that are not the the typical solution they're thinking through things a little bit differently they're not just taking it in a very siloed blinded view so leveraging that creativity and a little bit more creative thoughts in your client relationships and in your your colleague relationships is absolutely critical now when we think about legal interactions and anxiety um i and i won't see anybody do this hopefully but who likes to be wrong and who likes to not know things and I'm, I'm glancing over and I'm not seeing, I'm seeing some head shakes, but I'm not seeing any applause or thumbs up because nobody likes feeling that. And the main aha moment that I've had with a lot of the attorneys that I coach and work with is understanding that when your client calls you, they're an attorney too. So if you're working with an in-house counsel, understand that yes, they are your client, but understand that they're also very, very, uh, you know, they're, they're on the same plane as you as far as legal understanding. And what they have had to do at that point is they have had to admit that they get to a certain point where they either don't know something, they don't have the bandwidth to figure it out. Maybe they understand something, but they're not quite sure. And that little bit of doubt could be catastrophic in a decision. So they're seeking out guidance. They're seeking out further answers. So again, think about the last time that you didn't know something, you feel anxious, you feel vulnerable, you feel a little bit uh, exposed because you don't have all the answers. So imagine then your client feeling the same way. And when they pick up the phone or they send you an email or they send you a text and say, hey, I need your help. That's a very vulnerable position to be in. 
And so the aha moment came when I started coaching attorneys to say, go into those conversations, those interactions with empathy and compassion, as opposed to being the hero problem solver. That is where you develop your relationships. That's where you develop trust. Same thing with colleagues. If a colleague calls you up and they're not sure, go into it with empathy. Go into it as a, a joint conversation where you're really trying to help the other individual. That situation in itself is a complete game changer for your client relationships and for your internal relationships at your firm. An emotional contagion. So if you think about the last time, which seems like forever ago, that we were you know, in networking events or in social gatherings and there was a group of us and then there was that one person that would walk up that you, know, you, you all kind of grimace a little bit because maybe they're not the best conversationalist, maybe they're offensive, maybe that they're, just, they're, they're a little bit of a hothead or they're a little bit too aggressive. And all of a sudden that group starts a little bit, you know, starts dispersing a little bit. Why? Because that individual is now walking towards your group to join your group and they're bringing what we call an emotional contagion with them. They're bringing this negativity. They're bringing this aggression. They're bringing this selfishness to the group and nobody wants to be around that. The same thing applies with all of us. We are what we, what we put out in the world. So if you are constantly negative, if you're constantly stressed, if you're constantly in this mode where you're trying to push a, a non-positive or a non-empathetic or a non-compassionate emotion, you're going to get what you put out. So be very aware of how you handle situations. So again, if you're working with a colleague or you're working with a client, how you act and react is going to set the tone for that conversation and really push how things are going to happen with you, your clients, and your colleagues. Now, I'll go through some of these critical traits, and these are proof points that support the data of attorneys being the second lowest emotional intelligence profession in the world. Skepticism. Attorneys are on the 90th percentile of skepticism, which should not be shocking. If you're doubting that, then you're playing right into the statistic because you're skeptical of my data, but the data is true. This really is fantastic when you're talking about legal analyst, analysis or litigation. Those things are really, really key because you're taught and you're trained to look for the, the gaps or look for the problems or look for the mistakes so that you can fix them. But what that is not good for is trust and collaboration. Because if you think about going into your next conversation, so let's imagine you're going to work with me and you come in and you're skeptical, you're not gonna trust me right away. I will earn that trust because of my fantastic jacket and my fantastic singing ability. But what, I, what you have to understand is that by being skeptical, you break that trust and collaboration on the front end and you make it harder to create it. So really focus on being less skeptical when you're interacting with individuals and having those conversations. Bring that back because it's hard to shut that off if you're moving from work to conversation or work to personal life. Make sure that you're dedicating that time to shut that skepticism off because it could bleed over into those conversations and be, be damaging to your, to your relationships. When you think about urgency, you're in the 71st percentile for urgency. Again, something that comes with the territory. You're taught to be responsive to your clients. You're taught to always be on. You're taught to always be available. And everything is a rush. Everything is in a hurry because you need to get something done. You need to take care of a solution for a, a client as soon as possible. You need to get back to their email. You need to call them back immediately, immediately, immediately. But if you immediately do everything across the board, you're going to have a lot of problems with your bandwidth. So it's really, it's really critical to be thinking about how you can balance your need to respond because it is key to client service, but then how are you building your relationship? So if you go from this rush, rush, rush mindset, and then you have a colleague or a client call you, they want your time and they want to talk with you about something, you need to learn how to switch gears. And I'll, we'll talk about that when we come into to triggers and scenarios, but it's really key to shut that urgency off. And then resilience, again, this should not be very shocking that you're in the lower percentile because attorneys by nature are not resilient. You don't like negative feedback. You don't like being wrong. You, and who does really? But when we talk about feedback in, in client service specifically, that is the best thing in the entire world. And I, I've worked with numerous firms and clients on client service feedback programs. And there's always this panic moment. Like, you want me to call my client and ask them how I'm doing? Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Like, that's not something that I want to do because why? We may hear something negative. We may hear that we're not doing an A plus job across the board. But the blessing of that is, is that your client is telling you that they want to continue to do work with you. 
They're giving you feedback because they care about the relationship and they want better and they know that you can do better. You wouldn't give feedback to somebody that you didn't think was capable of, of achieving that. And the last time, think about yourself as a consumer. The last time you had a bad experience with a company or a service or a destination, when was the last time you got that survey after the fact and you thought, that service was so bad, I'm not gonna bother giving feedback on this, I don't care, I'm, I'm just gonna leave. And when was the last time that your client sent you, and I'll, I'll date myself a little bit here, but sent you a breakup mixtape because they were just tired of, of how bad you were serving them or you weren't giving them what they needed. So they sent you a letter and said, hey, you know, Rich, I appreciate all the work that you've done. Eh, it's not you, it's me. Here's my breakup mixtape. Here's all my sad songs that are gonna make me think of you after the fact. They just move their work. So if they're not giving you feedback, understand that they're probably talking to another firm or if you're not soliciting that feedback, another firm is. So be really mindful that your resilience could damage your relationships. Go for that feedback. That feedback is where you find the power in the relationship and where you find power to improve. And emotional and triggers, these are situations and they could be people, they could be words, they could be sounds, they could be smells, everything is a trigger. And you have thousands of triggers throughout the entire day. You could be going along. Yesterday, I had a, a situation where I was going along and my son came by my office and was singing a song. That song got stuck in my head the rest of the day, but it was a trigger because it was a happy song. It made me happy to see my son singing the song and smiling. So it was an emotional trigger for me. Now, again, there's also negative triggers. So when you look at your inbox and you see urgent emails, or I got to have this in an hour, or I got to do this, you stress, you, you tighten up, you become very anxious. Those are triggers that are going to move your mood. So understanding what your triggers are and what I will highly encourage, and I'll mention this later on when I talk about exercises, what I highly encourage people to do is keep a journal of your triggers. At the end of the day, it doesn't have to be lengthy, but get it at the end of the day, take five, 10 minutes and sit and look at your day and think about what happened. What made you happy? What made you anxious? What made you angry? Who did it? What was the scenario? And Think about those scenarios that are moving your mood you know, up and down, positively and negatively. And then once you get into those situations, you can practice a different, different response. I had an attorney one time that was very negative towards me, very almost verbally abusive. And so finally one day he, he blew up at me on something that wasn't even my fault. And I looked at him and it's, instead of being stressed as I always was every time I heard his voice or saw his name pop up in my inbox, I said, you know what, Mike, I want to help you. I want to help you, but I cannot help you if you're gonna to continue to scream at me. So if you want my help, you have to stop. And yes, my heart was in my throat and I thought he was gonna punch me through the back of my wall when I said that, but it actually was a game changer with our relationship. He became the person that was the nicest to me. He, we had a great relationship. We developed a really good rapport and people were actually shocked that I was the person, I was, I was the mic tamer because I got him off of this negative streak of, of activity and behavior because I practiced a different response. So think about those individuals that maybe you have a, an inherent need to stress out every time you think about meeting with them or connecting with them or calling them. Think about how you can say, you know what, I'm not gonna let this own me. I'm going to be positive in my conversation, positive in my response with them. It is absolutely a differentiator and can really set, your, set you free and bring control back in your life where that person is controlling your emotions otherwise. So managing your triggers, it's really, really important that we, that we manage our triggers in our communication and in our days, whoops, sorry, there we go. So and when you manage your triggers, it really is key to understand all the emotions that go into that trigger, understanding everything that's going on. So it's not just that person makes me sad. It's that individual makes me sad when they do this, this is exactly how I feel and here's why. Understanding all of those elements and bringing those elements into one core group of, of thought is really, really key to figuring out how you can practice that different reaction and how you can take that control back. Put those things into words because often we just, we have a feeling, we dismiss it because we're embarrassed by the feeling even if nobody sees us upset or, or sad or frustrated, we, we get embarrassed by vulnerability, we get embarrassed by fault. So think about those things and embrace those. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to be stressed and anxious, but understanding those will help you get that power back and putting those feelings into words will help you get that power back. Now, this is where we have some fun. 
And I know Keith's had a lot of fun with me on the front end and I completely love it because that's, that's who I am. But all of the things that Keith featured about me earlier are part of why I have a really good emotional intelligence. I leverage music all the time for my emotional intelligence. And, and this is the list that I mentioned earlier that all of these things are fun. All of these things are, are good activities and things to do to increase your, your emotional intelligence. I meditate every morning and every evening because it gives me balance. It allows me to understand my emotions and balance who I am and what I think and feel. And so that it was a big difference for me and I've been doing it for a couple of years now. So 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening, every single day, it has completely helped me balance everything that's going on, no matter how good or bad my day is. It helps me understand what went right, what went wrong, and how I can maximize those, those lessons going into the next day. Um, again, music, I am, I am a music fiend. I think I have, before I started moving on to Spotify more often, I think I have about 50,000 songs in my iTunes from my DJ days. And I'm, I'm just a music fiend. And it's across the board, everything but country music. Um, no offense to country music lovers, but I have music. I have playlists for every single mood. I have a workout playlist. I have a running playlist. I have a happy playlist. I have a melancholy playlist. I have a, a chill out playlist. All these playlists help me navigate my mood. So if I'm feeling anxious, I put on my relaxing playlist. It helps me calm down and it's balancing my emotions. I exercise a lot because it's something that helps me manage my stress. Again, any of these things, there's got to be something on here. And if if you don't like sleep, we may have to have another conversation about that. So there's something on this list for everybody. So find what is going to be key to you. And I'm going to share some infographics with Keith to share with you uh, after this presentation that'll remind you of some of the activities that you can do. But these, all of these will help you in some way, but leverage as many of these as you possibly can to increase your emotional intelligence and help you balance your emotions and balance your understanding of your days. Now, what's in it for you? Professional benefits of higher emotional intelligence. The main thing that I think is really key here is effective communication, because especially in the virtual world, especially in, in, a, in a day and age where there are way too many ways to be accessed, email, text, phone, WhatsApp, all these different activities that are going to be able to, to make you available so you feel like you're on 24 hours a day. You get stressed out and you get really, you, you get tired of communicating because we communicate all the time. But when you focus on your emotional intelligence and you focus on your mood and you focus on your balance, you become a more effective communicator, both speaking and listening. Because again, active listening is a big key to this, which is ironic for a, a speaker to say that you should listen more. Um, but really it's important that you, you leverage emotional intelligence for all of these, but effective communication in this day and age is absolutely paramount. Understanding how you can best communicate with your colleagues, best communicate with your clients, best communicate with your family. Those are all going to be key elements of how you can manage your days in a, in a better sense. Uh, but professionally, the better, of a, better communication you have, the more effective you are, the more highly regarded you are, and the better your relationships both at your firm and with your clients are going to be. It is absolute, I can't stress this enough, how important it is to leverage that from a speaking and a listening standpoint. And I'm, again, I have more content around that that I can dive into and that I will share with you, uh, but happy to talk through that any other time that you want. Now, personally, because while it may seem like we spend all of our hours at work, we also have a personal life and we want to have personal happiness. And that personal happiness has more effect on your, per on your professional life and your, prof your professional feelings than you would like to admit. So where you have that free time, to really exercise your personal happiness, it's going to bring more happiness to your work life. It is something that I've seen and I've coached through numerous times. I've had attorneys that are wildly successful that would be considered the top rainmaker or revenue generator in their firm, but they were miserable personally. And so the, the, the potential for them going off the rails professionally was a lot higher because they didn't have that personal balance. Um, boundaries were a huge thing. That's the one thing that I've been coaching and, and teaching more on than anything lately is setting boundaries because especially in the virtual environment where we're working from home, not only did we feel on and available all the time when we had an office that we were going to, no matter where your geography is, when you were going into the office and you had that, because there's some sort of separation between office and home. But now that we're home and our home is our office, there seems to be less of, a, of, a, of an area that you can separate. This is where you can take control back dramatically. 
And the one thing that I've coached on and the one thing that I've implored in my life that has been most effective is setting up boundaries on time. So if I need to go for a walk for 30 minutes from one to one thirty, I encourage people and I do this myself, I'll set up my out of office to say, I will be unavailable from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. I'd be happy to get back to you at 1.30 p.m. If it is absolutely urgent, if it cannot wait, here is my cell phone number. Not only have I not ever had my phone ring, not because I'm not important, but it is, it is interesting that people respect that boundary. They understand that I am not available for 30 minutes. And I've never had anybody question or criticize that. But what I have had is people respond back to me or when I pick up the phone and call them at 1.30 to get back to their email, they say, you know what? That's brilliant. That is absolutely genius that you did that. I feel empowered to do that too. And I feel, and when people put that into action, they say that they feel more refreshed. They feel more in control because you're setting that boundary. You're saying that I'm unavailable. And again, in our profession, we want to feel available all the time because we feel like if we're not available, then somebody else is going to be that's going to displace us. That's not the case. Now more than ever, people realize and respect mental health, self-care, self-awareness. They respect that more because we've all gone through frustration and, and, and uncertainty and higher levels of stress and anxiety in the last six, seven months than ever before in our own knowledge. So again, hey, Rich, yes. Can I just say that is a fantastic idea and I, I really want to comment on it because if, if nothing else you said today makes it through to, to any of us, that is a tool that I'm going to employ. I already know how I'm going to employ it. I'm thinking about it right now. Actually, you telling me that has already lifted a little bit of weight off me because now I have a strategy for dealing with something I know I'm going to have to deal with in the upcoming weeks. Chris, I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. And that, you know, that to me, like I, I, when I do presentations or when I do my podcast, my goal is to impress one person. Not impress like I want to be impressive, but I want to impress upon somebody something that helps them make their life better. And so I can't tell you how much I appreciate you sharing that with me. And I'm thrilled that it's just lifted your spirits already. And the other part of it too, while it gives you that protection and that boundary to be able to protect your time and your self, your self health, it also is a great conversation starter. So again, like, I don't think it's a bad idea to say, Hey, I'm going to be away from my email on Saturday and Sunday because I'm, you know, my son's birthday is coming up and I have my out of office already set up that I'm taking the day off for his birthday. And I'm putting that in my out of office. I am unavailable because I am celebrating my son's birthday. And when you come back from those, because I've done that before, you, you come back and people say, oh, tell me about your trip. Tell me about your son's birthday. Tell me about that painting class that you went to because you put that in your out of office. So it becomes a, a rapport builder. But more, more importantly, it gives you that balance and it gives you that permission to take care of yourself. So thank you. I look forward to hearing more about that because I, I can already tell in your face that it's, it's lifted some stress and it's given you some power back and control back in your emotions. And if anybody else has comments, please, or questions, I'm, I'm, I, I promise you I will stop talking. I know that I sound like one of those wind up toys that just never stops, uh, but I will, I will pause here for questions and, and, and feedback in just a second uh, because I'm also going to give you one of the best virtual tips for connecting and networking that you will possibly ever have. So while I'm giving you also permission to take care of yourself, I wanna give you permission to be effective connectors and networkers. So if you all have LinkedIn, uh, this is my, my little tip of the day that I wanna provide for you before we do a little Q and A. So if you have the LinkedIn app on your phone, if you wanna go ahead and open it up, and what I will show you is that in the top of the app, you'll see the search bar. So if you look here, and I'll try to, my lights are a little bit blinding. The very top bar on the far right, there are three squares and an X. So if you click on that, and it'll likely ask you to give, you, give permission to your camera, um, but there is a scanner. So you'll see a QR scanner pop up. If you hold that scanner over my QR code, it takes you directly to my profile. For those of you that wanna connect with clients, with prospects, if you do presentations, if you do webinars, this is absolutely, and I keep using the word game changer because that's my, day, my word of the day. This is a game changer. The first time I tried this, and I have some friends at work at LinkedIn that gave, that gave me the, the cue on this before it happened a couple of years ago. The first time I tried this was at a presentation in Chicago where I had about 150 people in the audience. And I showed this. By the end of the presentation, I had 150 connections because they all gave it a go. And that is a phenomenal network builder. I think LinkedIn, and we can do a whole nother session on LinkedIn because that's 
you know, I'm, I get nerd, like very nerdy about some topics. LinkedIn's one of them. House music is another one, um, you know, movies and things like that. But LinkedIn is one that I could talk about all day long. Um, but this to me is, is, a, is a, a big differentiator from a global perspective, from a virtual perspective. So um, please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I would be more than happy to answer any other questions or support you or, or do whatever I can because again, I am, I am very much of the servant mentality and I wanna make sure that you all get everything that you need to be successful. And that's one thing that I've shared with Keith that I, I love about Mackerel is that there's this, this genuine investment in the person and genuine investment in the, in the professional but it is really key that you want to do that and that you find the resources and take care of, and take advantage of the resources that are given you. And, and Macro does a phenomenal job of providing that for you all. So one, I applaud the organization. Two, I applaud you all for taking advantage on, on webinars like this or other opportunities for, for professional and personal uh, development. So I will, I will pause and, and have a sip of coffee and I would love to answer any questions that you have. Uh, I'll leave this up. So if you want to scan it and, and connect with me, that, that's great. Um, but I am definitely open to any questions. You know, honestly, in this situation, I'd like to, you know, for those of you that have not been to Las Vegas, the saying is that whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Of course, now with mobile phones, sometimes that doesn't happen. But this is a Vegas conversation. So if you have a question, any question is on the table, I would love to help out if there's a scenario. And Christopher, I, again, I appreciate you sharing your insights. If there's been an aha moment or there's something that you're considering, please feel free to ask it. I can, uh, Roland here from, from Belgium talking, I can only confirm what, what Chris and what you said is that unfortunately uh, all my clients or almost all of my clients have my private mobile phone number and they tend to call me whenever they need me uh, directly on my mobile phone even when I'm on a holiday. And I've noticed that when I say to them, oh, great to hear you. Uh, and I say, but I'm on holiday any problem that I call you back or, you know, have somebody of the office call you back. Uh, they always say, of course not, not a problem at all. Sure, sure. S sorry to interrupt your holiday. Please enjoy it. And, and, you know, so it's true that, that if you set out your boundaries, people indeed tend to respect them without any problem, which is a good thing because we are always afraid to being unavailable for clients and think they might, you know, turn to another lawyer, if not the first one to pick up the phone. And thank you, Roland, for sharing that. I, you know, I think that that has also been a communication point that I've that I've reiterated to those attorneys that I've coached is that, and I and I mean this with all the all the respect in the world, your clients are not demand robots. They are humans too. They have the same stressors that you do. They have the same anxiety that you do. They have the same demands on their time that you do. So they understand those things. And I appreciate you sharing that experience with them because it's, it is, it, it's okay. It may feel terrifying the first time you say, I'm not available because inherently, and I've, I've had this happen to me where I think if I say I'm not available, somebody's going to perceive me as lazy or checked out or that I don't care. But in, in, in actuality, and in, in some of that explanation about putting things in your out of office or explaining that, hey, I'm, I'm with my family on holiday. Is there something that I can help you with? Or you know, do you mind if I give you a call back in two days that I can, I can answer or somebody else in the office can, can assist you? People understand that because they go on holiday too. They, they have families too. They have personal needs too. So it's really, really key to setting those boundaries. It will be terrifying the first time. I promise you it will be, but it will be okay. I just want to add is that I always want to make sure that I, I give them a solution. I just don't say I'm unavailable. Um, right. Or immediately add, but you know, I can give you, I can ask somebody of the, of the firm to call you back and, and help you out if it's urgent. If not, you know, we'll talk in two or three days. But I always give, I always try to give them a solution so that they at least they feel they've been helped out. Oh, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. I, I have a slightly less helpful suggestion. <laughs> I take the phone call, I tell them on, I'm on vacation, I'm at such and such resort, I'm happy to talk to you for half an hour. And it won't show up on your bill, but my dinner tonight is going to show up on your bill. And, <laughs> and people actually go for that. They're like, sure, I'm, whatever, Send, you know, put it on my bill. You know, and I think both, I, I think it's not unhelpful. I think it's, I think it's a great rapport builder. Again, you know, when you have that kind of rapport with your clients that you could say that and they, they don't take offense to it, I think that's fantastic. So kudos to you for building that rapport with your clients. Hey, hey, Rich, this is Azeem from DC. Um, just wanted to thank you for this very helpful presentation. 
And just to build off some of those comments, um, Zim, I think your microphone's gone out a little bit. It sounded Can you a hear bit. Me now? Yeah, there you go. Oh, great. Um, what I was saying was, you know, for most of my, my legal career, I've been of the mindset that when a client reaches out to you, you drop whatever you're doing, you, you, you answer, you, you, you provide that immediate service because that's how you show them that, you know, you're there for them no matter what. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had to change that attitude most recently because of the situation that we're all in dealing with the pandemic, right? Uh, many of us are still working from home, dealing with competing issues, you know, family life, kids, what have you. And so I've had to automatically adjust and say, you know what, I'm not available until this time, you know, late night, early morning, what have you. And, you know, I've come to recognize that everyone has been understanding, you know, of the situation that we're all in. As you mentioned, you know, they're not demand, you know, machines, they're, they're people, they're dealing with the same issues at home as well. And so I think, you know, um, when you treat your clients as people, they will do the same for you. And uh, I think that's just good advice to everyone should, you know, heed. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate you sharing that. And I think, too, when we, when we stop and put ourselves in the shoes of the consumer or the one that's being serviced, and we think about, like I had an, an, an opportunity to experience that yesterday with Apple. I have some headphones that, that are not working. And unfortunately, going into it from my knowledge, I thought it was going to cost me a fortune to have these things replaced. And just in a simple act of kindness, both to and from me with this, with this person I interacted with, they're sending me a brand new pair of headphones for free. Small thing, but now that loyalty has been changed. Again, because the other person understood what it felt like to be helpless or to not have a solution that is ideal. And they had the ability to, to give me a good experience. You know, again, when we think about how we like to be treated as clients, then we change our perspective on how we treat our clients. So, you know, we, we've all, you know, we've probably all dealt with a real estate agent or an accountant or somebody that has helped us with a very important thing. And they will give us that excellent client service. So really pay attention to how, what experiences you've had as a consumer and what, what made it a great experience. And I think as what you were talking about, understanding that this that person to person connection and that person to person relationship and the empathy and compassion that comes with those experiences that completely bonds the relationship rich hi um nick from london here i've got an interesting question i just want to know how much do you think um emotional intelligence the ability to be open and empathize with clients and colleagues is a lawyer thing versus a generational thing I find it quite ironic that this is a next generation talk, but I think most people in this generation are all naturally quite open, naturally quite high EQ. Um, let's say maybe the more mature generation come from a different uh, work ethos, so they might not have been told this or they might not have this natural development in them. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? It's, it's a great question, Nick, and I appreciate that. And I will, I'll try to, to talk to the generational thing carefully so I don't spout any more gray hairs than I already have. Um, but what I will say is that is it's a little bit of a blend for both. So for the, for the younger generation of attorneys, you've got a little bit more uh, of a struggle with this because you've grown up in the social media age. You've grown up in an in instant communication age. It's not been born into you. It's not been very, you've not been very surrounded by the, the need for relationship building and the need for empathy and the need for compassion because everything is very instant and very quick and very, you know, surface value. We've, we've lived off social media for so long in the last, you know, and, and it's been such a core factor for us over the last several years. And that's what you've been raised on. You know, I, I will date myself and say that it wasn't until college that we actually had email. So, you know, wrap your head around that, that I'm that old, that email didn't exist until I was my, a freshman in college. Um, so that in of itself is, is problematic. So yes, there are the factors of being an attorney that you, again, have spent a lot of time and, and effort and money learning to be perfect, learning to be analytical, learning to be you know, flawless. So you start taking on that inherent need to be less emotionally intelligent because your career calls for it. But I think adding on that generational factor does add some complexity to it. 
but I, I encourage you. And I think the one thing that I will say though, is that there are elements that I've seen. Um, so some of my team members are, are of a younger generation, but they are very mindful. Um, they're very, they're very into the activities that would, would breed more in emotional intelligence. Some could do better, I, I will admit, but we also have conversations about that. So where a younger teammate of mine is engaging with a, a, an attorney of an older generation, I say, you've got to slow down a little bit, engage the conversation, ask more questions and be a little bit more probing because that's where the relationship is built. That's where the true answers will come because if you're just trying to rapid fire because that's inherently what you're used to, that's not going to get you to the success level that you want to be at. So I, I, I think it's a brilliant question. I think it, it is a little bit struggle. So, so I will say that the younger generation, you need to meditate more. You need to listen to more music. You need to sleep more. Um, and, you know, and honestly, it's, it's okay to be empathetic. It's okay to pick up the phone. Like I can't tell you how many times a team member of mine has texted me and I've called them and it's gone straight to voicemail. And I think like, they're probably sitting there, who's this psycho trying to call me on the phone because they're not used to talking on the phone. Like that is a lost art. So, and it, it, be very conscious and practice those things. You know, don't, don't just revert to the activities that you're used to spend more time in those activities, spend more time on the phone, set up conversations a little bit longer, but understand that you're developing your emotional intelligence and you're not just diverting from your own personality and what you've learned to this point. But it's a great, it's a uh, phenomenal question. No, that, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you, a great answer. Um, also, I DJ too, so we should go back to back very oh, soon. Oh, we absolutely <laughs> should. We, we should have, this would be the first time the Mackerel's had an after party of one of their webinars and it will be a, I think a, so. a day dance. I'm a day tea dance <laughs> at time. Thank you. And while we're talking about that, I think we have a third DJ who registered. I'm not sure if Mark Cahoon is with us, but uh, certainly, are you with us, Mark? I am. I... <laughs> there you go. Great. So we've got three DJs on the call. I think everyone's a DJ in this uh, call, actually. They, they are. <laughs> and, and when we get back to an in-person event, the three of us will be on the bill and we will have a, a, a stellar either social or a, a late night party. So we, we've already got the lineup set. Yeah, only vinyl, only vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> only, exactly, only vinyl. Great. Any more questions for, for Rich? Um, yes, hi, this is Patrick. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, my video is still not working. Um, first of all, I'm looking forward to all of your performances on the next uh, in-person meeting. But um, I want to get back to one point that you said in the middle of the presentation um, about shutting down the urgency that we have uh, in client meetings. Um, and I've been trying to do that to not give the impression that I have like half an hour for this client and the next half an hour for the next one. But um, what I've experienced personally is that this uh, has kind of um, made it more urgent in between client meetings. So what I'm trying to take out of the meetings with the client kind of is not gone, but it, it builds up and it increases the stress in between. So um, you have a suggestion for that? I absolutely do. And it's another, another boundary set that I've put into effect. And I'm assuming that you probably have those calendars where one block lines up to the next one, lines up to the next one, lines up to the next one. And so you have this full day of meetings and you have no breathing room in between, right? Yes. Okay. So... I, I've been there and, and I've actually have been there this week and it's, it's reminded me of my own practice. So what I always encourage, so if you go back to your days in school and, and, and I'm hoping all your school experiences were like mine, that between classes you had about 10 minutes to get to your locker, change your books out, go to the next class. So there was that in between time that you had to, to shift gears. So I was going from science class to geography class. You know, I, I could prepare my mind for what I was about to do. Same thing with our days now as adults and as professionals. What I do now is I don't schedule hour long meetings. I schedule 45 minute meetings. I don't schedule 30 minute meetings. I schedule 20, 25 minute meetings. And I have a pad of paper that I am taking notes during my meetings with my clients. And then the minute that 45 minutes hits, I have 15 minutes until my next meeting. One, to digest what just happened and identify next steps that I could be as effective as I can be for my client. Uh, number two, I can get water because again, our personal needs don't go out the out, go, don't go out the door. And if we go meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, you all of a sudden I felt guilty going to get tea one day 
That's ridiculous. Why should I feel guilty getting hydrated between meetings and I was late, you know, two minutes late to the next meeting and I had to apologize. I verbally apologized and then finally I said, you know what, I don't apologize. I'm not sorry for being late. I'm sorry for poor scheduling on my part, but I'm not sorry for being late because I needed to get tea and get, a, get something to eat because I've been in back-to-back -back meetings. So I, I encourage you to focus on changing your meeting times and blocking time in between those meetings to be more effective and to be less stressed because that, that avalanche, that downhill slide of a day can be really detrimental because we get to the end of that day and then we think, what just happened? What, what just happened to my day? I got nothing done. I, I feel like I've completely forgotten what the first client said at eight o'clock this morning and now it's six o'clock and I can't recall the nuances of the conversation because I've just been in back-to-back -back meetings all day. Hey Rich, one point I'd like to add is um, mm -hmm. There, there will be times when you come across those clients who aren't understanding, who do demand that you drop everything, you know, uh, you know, immediately to, to attend to their needs and uh, who frankly, you know, maybe aren't all that human. And, um, you, you, you know, I've come across some of those characters in my life and I'm sure many of you have as well. And, you know, it's, it may be difficult for young lawyers, but you come to realize maybe it's not, you know, maybe they're not the best client to have. And maybe it's not worth those billables to keep that client around and in your life, you know? So sometimes you got to make judgment calls and think about, you know, the greater, you know, the, you know what's best for yourself and your practice overall in the long term and, and cut out folks, uh, even clients that may not, you know, be the best examples. I, I, and I can't find my applause button anywhere because I've got the screen share up, but I, would, I applaud that all day long. And again, this will sound backwards and I'm watching faces as I say this. It's okay to fire a client. It's okay to separate yourself. If you think about the 80-20 rule of, of anything, if you're spending 80% of energy on the 20% of clients that are just, to your point, they, they're not understanding, they're miserable to work for, you will find other clients. I promise you, you will. But if you're spending, because those clients also will take up a, a vast amount of your time, they'll take up almost all of your energy and or poison the positive energy that you had to begin with. So I, I can't, I can't, like, I, I applaud you for that because that is so key. That is so important. On the flip side, until you get to a point where you feel comfortable getting rid of that client, I intentionally, I have one person that I work with that now I'm like, I, I need to call them and fire them today. Um, I have a client that I work with that I thought was a very nice person has turned out not to be. And so I know now when I have calls on the calendar with them, I block 15 minutes after that call and I have one of my playlists pulled up. And this sounds silly, but it works. As soon as I get off that call and it is a loud screaming heavy metal playlist, I take that 15 minutes and I play a couple of songs. I get that energy out and I move on with my day. But I also, in that time, think they don't own this space up here. This is not, I'm not going to let them live rent free up here. And so if you, if you understand that and take control back, again, practicing a different reaction. But again, like if you want if, to, if, it's not very soothing, but if you ever want to hear me sing heavy metal and it's terrifying, find me after that meeting because that 15 minutes is, is, is loud and hard. There, there, are, there are people, regardless of aesthetics, um, that will constantly need from others and because they're not happy themselves. And so they will pull where they see, you know, I, I call them energy suckers. They will look for that positive pool of energy and they will go after it and they will suck it because they need that to replenish themselves because they can't find their own happiness. So again, like you're going to have those people in your life there and they come out of nowhere. So just be, be protective of your energy, be protective of your mind. Are we saying treat them mean, keep them keen kind of thing? I would, I, I, I'm thinking of well, that. Well, as, as, as in the case of that, if you're too, let's say, subservient or too willing to give everything to a client, then they'll just ask for the world. Whereas if you, like you said, keep them at arm's length, keep them restricted, then they want more. They don't understand why they can't get it. Right. You, you, you open up the unlimited potential for them and they will take it. And they will not care what else you have going on. They will not care what else, what other clients you have. They will not care about your family, your kids, 
They don't care. They need you, but they need it in a toxic way. So again, you know, and, and that may be, you know, I, we, Minnesota is known as being a very passive aggressive state by culture. And so it's a passive aggressive way. So if you're constantly not available or you're keeping that client that is negative, that is sucking, sucking you dry of energy, keeping them at arm's length, they may get irritated and go try to find somebody else that they can go suck the life out of. Great. And they move on and your life becomes happier and you can spend that new time that you've been spending on that client going to find a new client that maybe aligns better with your practice, aligns better with your happiness, aligns better with your communication style. But yeah, you give, you give, them, you give them the blank check and they will, they will cash it for everything you are. Rich, um, we just hit the three o'clock uh, in the UK mark, the hour mark. Um, so I want to say, you know, thank you so much uh, for, for the insight. I think it's probably uh, given us more than, than we expected 